go ahead and get started, everyone. Uh, my name is Ted Levine. I'm president and CEO of Kids Discover, and we're super excited for today's webinar about honoring curiosity in the reading classroom. I want to thank everyone for taking the time out of their busy schedules. I know this is an incredibly busy time of year as the school year starts. Um, and I want to thank Monica Burns, who we just love working with. And um, also, uh, you know, she's just been tremendous to work with uh, over the last few weeks as we've put this together. Um, before we get started, just a couple housekeeping items. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, so we'll be sending out a link where you can view the entire webinar later this week. So be on the lookout for an email. We'll send that out. And we're also going to do a few polls today. Um, so I'd love if Monica would just launch the first poll for us today. Um, and, uh, you know, feel free to participate with the polls. Uh, this is the first of three. If you would just go ahead and fill that out, uh, that would be tremendous. Um, and, uh, you know, you'll all notice that all the attendees are on mute. So we'd encourage you to type in any questions that you have into the chat function. Uh, that's just on the GoToWebinar control panel on the right side of your screen. And uh, we'll have a chance to answer those questions uh, throughout the webinar and also at the end. And you can also minimize that control panel if you want just by clicking that, that orange uh, arrow button on the top right. Um, so uh, let's go out and close out the first poll. Let's see what the results are. And so we really wanted to just gauge sort of the audience. And interestingly enough, we have a large representation from sort of early elementary K2 and also high school. Um, and uh, as well coming in third sort of grades five and six. So it's always really nice to understand who is joining the webinar, um, but I think we have a really sort of broad representation, uh, which is always interesting. And uh, again, we'll, we'll be filling out a few more polls throughout the whole process. So, uh, okay, enough for me. Uh, I do now wanna introduce our good friend, Monica Burns, who's put together a really awesome program today on a topic that is really at the core of what Kids Discover does and is all about. So without further ado, Monica, take it away. Hi there, hello everyone. I'm very excited to be here. I'm trying to get into full screen mode. We'll see if um, I, oop, I saw that coming when, we, when it got us stuck there. So we'll pull it back up here. Great, there we go. So yep, I'm so excited to be here with you all today to talk about a topic that I am just really passionate about and connects so well to, to some of our goals um, to share with you today, which is honoring curiosity in the reading classroom. And so for those of you who have um, heard me share some of my favorite things and my strategies and tips um, for using technology in the classroom, um, you may already know that I'm a former New York City public school teacher. I've been out of the classroom for a couple years working on some book projects like Taming the Wild Text with literacy strategies for today's readers and Tasks Before Apps, Designing Rigorous Learning in a Tech-Rich Classroom, which comes out in just a couple weeks, uh, just next month. And then of course, sharing lots of my favorites and plenty of strategies uh, for the reading classroom and tech integration across the content areas on my blog, uh, classtechtips.com. So our goal today is to focus in on what it looks like to honor curiosity in the reading classroom. So here's a rundown of some of the topics we're going to touch upon as we go through our time together today. So we'll start off by exploring the importance of a wonder mindset in the classroom and what it means to really promote that idea of wondering, questioning, and gathering information about students' interest in the classroom. Then we'll start talking about how reading and researching flows in the real world, looking at some of those nonlinear pathways that we can explore as we are diving into learning about a new topic and how bringing that into the classroom really connects to the transferable skills we want to develop in students of all ages that they can take beyond the four walls of the classroom. 
Then we'll touch upon the power of cross-curricular learning. Now, this is an area where, you know, as a classroom teacher, I was especially passionate about bringing in a wide range of informational texts and literature that really helped connect what was happening in one part of the day to another part of the day. Um, so we're thinking about how to really leverage the power of cross-curricular learning so students are reading, researching, and writing about what they've read during lots of moments during the day, not in isolated uh, English language arts block. We'll talk about some questions to prompt that wondering um, in your class discussions, how to get kids talking about what they're reading and learning about, how to get them to think from one question to the next as we move through introducing new topics and new ideas to students uh, throughout the school year. So we'll start off with thinking first about this concept of a, a wonder mindset, right? What does it mean to help students cultivate questioning throughout their learning, throughout the school day, in many different corners of the school year? And so to start off, I'd like to share a quote. A wonder mindset is a way of thinking that values curiosity, asking questions, and searching for answers. So that's really what we're talking about today when we talk about curiosity in the reading classroom. Having students ask questions, so be confident in posting a question or posing a question, whether you're on an online forum or in a face-to-face -face discussion, and feeling confident to go out and search for answers as readers, as viewers, and as listeners. And so when we talk today about this concept that we're starting off with a wonder mindset, I think it's only appropriate connection to our big idea of how to make sure curiosity is front and center um, in the reading classroom. So the first thing to think about is how are we modeling questioning with think alouds. So although I'm out of the classroom right now, I spend a lot of time in classrooms. And just this morning, I was with a group of fourth graders um, for a reading lesson. We were diving into text together and talking about uh, connections to the world. That was our, our teaching objective this morning. And so part of that wonder mindset and Having students understand not just that it's okay to ask questions, but where do questions come from, right? Wow, does one question lead to another question? How is our content that we're working on and exploring something that can spark our curiosity and lead us down, down this journey? And so, for example, this morning, right, not only was I pushing students to to think about connections but i was also trying really hard to show off what i was thinking and so we'll call that you know we call that our think alouds that's not a, a term i've created but it's a term that i definitely embrace this idea that we are showing students what our thought process is really purposefully and so when we model questions with think alouds, you know, we come across a passage in a text and we say, you know, I wonder why, or I bet this means, or this reminds me of, or where could I go to find out the answer to the question that this sentence made me think of? So being really purposeful with modeling questioning with think alouds can show students not just that you're a lifelong learner that has interests and wonders about things, but that they are also encouraged to do the same thing when a piece of text pops up um, on their screen or on their desk or, or in their hand. And so modeling questioning with thinks aloud, think alouds can happen really organically, right? Maybe you have students right after the bell rings or coming together at the start of a lesson and you're just sharing something from your day, from a podcast you listen to on the car on the way to work uh, or a conversation you overheard on the train and, and letting them know that that's something that made you wonder where you had to Google and, and find an answer to something you weren't sure. But then of course this can happen really strategically. And that's where kind of your role as acting as that guide on the side happens, right? So you are thinking about what kind of things you're going to wonder aloud to students or how you're going to address a particular question that you anticipate coming up. And so this is 
part of your leading a lesson and introducing a skill and strategy, right? But then shifting to that guide on the side. So as students are diving into text independently or with a partner and you are listening into their conversations, right? How are we pushing them with questions to make them then wonder or to think about what they're reading in a few different ways. So when having conversations with students, pushing them with those questions that connect to the way that you've done a think aloud at the beginning of a lesson can really help promote a classroom community and culture where this idea of asking questions, wondering aloud about things, showing that confidence to really make sure curiosity is front and center. And so part of this is also giving students a space to explore their curiosity. So questions are wonderful, but if we're not giving kids a chance to search for their answers, then it doesn't always help them appreciate the importance of their questions or, or where to go when to, to find an answer. So giving students space to explore their curiosity could be having them make a map of all their favorite things or wonderings that they have or lingering questions after a read aloud or a unit that you've introduced to them, right? Or it could be presenting a series of topics and having them bounce around and, and dive in and explore. So if you know that you want students to think about a particular skill of examining a passage for author's bias or making connections between text and the world, right? Those are skills that can be applied to a variety of text types. So when we honor student curiosity in the classroom, like the screenshot from the folks at Kids Discover, right? There's lots of topics that they can bounce into, that they can jump into and explore all underneath that umbrella of your big goals, your objectives for an individual unit, yet students are diving into topics that they have expressed curiosity about, um, that they are naturally wondering about, that you've identified and pinpointed from different discussions, to really give students that space to explore their curiosity. Another strategy that can be useful for students who may not be the ones who say, I wonder, or what if, or I think I heard this, is that true, right? So we have some students who might jump in to those questions, both one-on-one, -on -one, small group, and, and whole class discussions. But for students who may not be as immediately willing to jump in and, and share what it is that they wonder, a wonder wall is a great strategy for getting kids to continuously add, to feel safe, to have a space where they can go and, and post questions. Now, a wonder wall could be a physical space, right? It could be a corner of your classroom with sticky notes, a poster where kids know they can write a question at the end of a unit that they can walk in at the beginning of a new lesson and you have a topic on the board and they can write something on that post-it that they wonder about and stick it up on the board. So it could be something that's really structured that you're encouraging everyone to do or that you have as a space that you visit over the course right, of a, a series of lessons or you encourage students to add one or two wonders to the wall over the course of the week and then you visit it on Friday, and then you share some of those things with the whole class. So a physical space, like a wonder wall in the corner of a classroom, could be one way to do it. Or if you have students working within a digital space, an LMS, a learning management system, you might also think for a moment about what you can do in that space to give kids the opportunity to post like in a kind of virtual back channel or to add on to a thread of a question that you posted to get their wheels spinning and to get them them wondering and feeling confident to share those those wonders those questions right in the classroom so shifting to from wonder mindset to reading and researching. So we know what it is that students are interested in learning more about. 
we want them to capture their questions, the things that they wonder and worry or are curious about. And we can transfer this into discussion on how students are reading and, and researching in the classroom. And so to start us off again, Children reading as researchers can collect facts, support opinions, and learn about the world around them. So when we provide students opportunities to dive into informational text, there are so many things that they can do once they are in that space, right? They can collect facts and information. They can connect those facts to support their opinions, whether they're writing informational text or researching to support a persuasive piece of writing or argumentative writing that they're working on. And of course, learn about the world around them, which we all know, right? The minute we watch a documentary, we see a clip on the news, we read a compelling article, ourselves as adults, learners start to to wonder or or pick up our phone and, and ask Siri a question about that country that was profiled or something to clarify as well. And so to get kids reading and researching in the classroom, we want them to have opportunities that mirror natural reading behaviors. And so students now so more than ever, right, with access to lots of digital resources, read and research in a non-linear format, right? It's no longer the way when we all went to school, right? We went to the library. I haven't seen a card catalog <laughs> in a long time, right? But we might have gone to the library, pulled out a handful of books, went straight back to the index to try and find that information that we were looking for, right? Maybe we're researching the Inca or the Maya and we pull out that book and we head straight to the index to find information about geography or what people ate in a particular civilization, right? When working on that type of, of research. Now students, natural reading behaviors, especially as they're diving through and reading and researching and, and online and digital formats are very different than what we might have experienced ourselves as readers and researchers as students. So we want to make sure that we're providing opportunities that are clearly mirroring natural reading behaviors. So helping students navigate text that looks different than what they would see on print paper, right? So leveraging the traditional skills that we do want them to develop as they open up a newspaper or flip through an encyclopedia, but also to understand the purpose of a hyperlink in an article to give them in connected information, the ability to highlight a word and hear it pronounced aloud. So these extra layers that students now have as readers are all possible when we leverage digital tools. So by leveraging digital tools as readers and researchers, we can empower students to transfer what's happening in the classroom to what they will do as they move forward, not just through their school career, but through their career outside of the classroom. So by leveraging digital tools, we're able to present text to students that they can interact with in completely new ways. So here's an example, right, where there might be reading resources that are gathered together into one unit with a variety of topics for students to, to explore. Right? When you're using digital tools, students have access to a search bar at the top of the screen where they can see something, it can spark their thinking, they can search to learn more about a particular topic. When students pull up digital content on a variety of platforms, you see this awesome right, Kids Discover example here, right? just like you see on the right hand side of the screen, right, they have that opportunity to dive into related resources or blog posts that are similar to the topic that they're searching. So we have to help students navigate this space um, in one of my new book about uh, reading in the in this new world, we call it Pam Allen, my co-author and I call it right, the taming the wild text, right? Where you have all this text in all these different spaces and we need to empower students to make the most of all this information at their fingertips. So when they're reading through in these digital spaces, how are we leveraging 
primary source documents when diving into historical texts? How are we leveraging photographs, images, interactive elements like a map when kids are pulling into more current events topics? We really want to make sure they are prepared um, the best that they can to leverage these digital tools in a variety of different spaces. This also connects to our idea, and one that I've mentioned already because it's so important as we think about exploring digital spaces and making sure that students have the tools they need to get to different spots, is to help them identify their reading pathways. So when they do click on a hyperlink, how do they get back to the body of the text? What is that hyperlink going to tell them when they tap on it and they click on their screen and they move on to a different area? So by having these conversations with students about their natural reading behaviors and the reading pathways that they take, we can really tie it back to our, our big idea today of honoring curiosity in the reading classroom because we want to make sure students know what it is that they're interested in notice when a new interest pops up based on some of their their clicks or their pathways that they take but also be mindful of how to narrow in on a particular topic stay focused on when they are working through digital tools with lots of resources that are pretty instantly at their fingertips. And so during these opportunities for students to read and research about topics that they're interested and excited about, we also wanna make sure that students' responses to their reading material feel authentic and are valued and have an audience, right? All those words that I always associate with that term, authentic. So when you are listening into students' interest, when you are hearing them ask questions and demonstrate what it is that they're curious about and wanna learn more about, you can tie those to authentic opportunities to respond to reading. So students might be researching for a variety of purposes, and we wanna set those purposes front and center from the get-go so students not just kind of buy into the idea of reading and researching in the classroom, but understand that a commitment commitment to their work can really influence what's happening outside of their school. So that might include having students read for the purpose of creating a public service announcement. So they have to research and find facts that support their opinion. They might be responding uh, by making some connections between informational text and a novel that they're reading. So being able to pull those two pieces all the literary essay elements, but is a piece that is published online, that is tweetable and shareable, that could be connected with the author of the article used as part of their evidence or the author of the novel that they were. Um, citing and, and using as a, a source for, for their argument. So when students are reading and researching, the more we can give them an authentic uh, response, letting them understand the purpose for what it is that they're creating, uh, the better. And that could be as simple as creating an exit slip for their reading that is really tweetable, right? Or a quick 140 characters response after reading an article, or something that is more robust for them to to dive into as a way to respond to their reading as well so when we're thinking about getting kids wondering and making sure they're comfortable being curious in the classroom to having multiple ways for them to read and research and explore um, both digital and print text we also want to make sure that there is a clear connection to what's happening in all parts of their school day so just like we know that reading and researching and diving into text is not isolated to just you know 40 minutes of the day that they appreciate that this is all part of their lifelong learning that they're developing and we can do that by making cross-curricular connections. Now, I came from my last few years in the classroom, I was able to um, be part of a transition from a public school 
kind of your regular local neighborhood school to a school that was able to get some federal funding to shift for a magnet theme. And so cross-curricular learning is something that I think about a lot because it was such a huge part of the effort, the time, the planning, and the goals that we had set forth um, to make sure our students had learning experiences that were threaded throughout the day. So I taught in a school that was, uh, its magnet theme was environmental stewardship. So that meant that we were reading lots of informational texts on everything from vermicomposting, which is composting with worms. We had a bucket of worms in the classroom, right? And reading about wind farms, but then also reading about people like Jane Goodall, um, who were important to thinking about stewardship within the environment. So that reading opportunities happen throughout the day. The writing opportunities when we wrote our own feature articles about why you should start uh, composting with worms or why you should investigate wind farms, right, all became part of just the everyday norm where in, you know, the goal is to not see there being a clear distinction between science and social studies and ELA, but all part of, of what's happening you know, all day and, and every day um, in the classroom. And so with that, you know, this quote that I like to share is really connected to what you know, we see ourselves do as learners. When students see you pull up a YouTube video to find the answer to a science question or use Google to search for a map to find directions before a field trip, they'll start to better understand how they themselves can use digital tools to fulfill their curiosity. So in all corners of the school day, right, really being mindful of how we are modeling and showing, right, how asking questions and searching for answers and applying those fit into all moments and, and all facets of the day. And so when we're thinking about that cross-curricular learning, identifying high interest text is so important. We want students to be interested in what it is that they are reading about, and we want to keep our instructional goals in mind. So if you know that you want students to understand what life was like during the American Revolution and you're pulling in texts that are of this topic, right? how can we make sure that this is of interest, that this is actionable, that this is connected to what students are, are interested in learning about? Now, you might not have a student put on a wonder wall or respond to a, a, a question in your, your LMS, uh, your learning management system by saying, you know, I want to learn more about <laughs> the Boston Tea Party, right? But they might tell you things like, I want to learn what people do when they are frustrated with how um, the rules that are given them are. I want to learn how someone could all of a sudden rise up in a rebellion, right? So those kind of questions, when we pose them to students in the context of our learning goals, can help make texts that might seem not as, as compelling at first, a lot more interesting to students. So we can think of it in that way, right, of building high interest opportunities into the text that connect to content area specific goals. But then we can also think about our ELA goals and how we can connect those goals to content that students are exploring different parts of their school day. So if you know that your students are, are interested in, in weather systems, that you know not only do you have a unit that talks about weather systems that comes up you know, in the second quarter right during your school year, but you also know that you are teaching informational text unit and you can then bring those two things together. So not only are we diving into the content area goals of weather systems, right, maybe students have shared with you that they're especially interested in learning about um, a cyclone, or they're especially interested in learning about tornadoes or water spouts, right? So within that content area um, that you've identified that you have specific objectives for, then making that connection between what you're doing in one part of your day to your ELA goals, like what type of bias is present when an author writes a particular article on a subject, or what type of key details stand out um, when we're reading that we can then pull into a writing activity. Now, 
for lack of a more kind of sensitive way of putting it, right? This is kind of also our um, kill a bird with kill one with two one bird with two stones, right? Or kill. <laughs> You can hear me right, trying to get out all these things after I was talking uh, this morning with that piece, right? But how can we make the most of our time um, to make sure that we can kill two birds with one stone um, during the day? And so those two things that you might want to um, spend some time thinking about, right, are your content area goals, but then your ELA goals. And so how can you really make sure that you're getting the most bang for your buck when you pull uh, those different texts um, into the work that you're doing in your classroom? So thinking about high interest texts in both um, directions. This also leads us into thinking about current events connections. So if you are um, exploring a particular content area goal, right, how can you make connections to what's happening outside of the classroom? So if there is a world event, a national event, a local event taking place, what can we do to make sure that we are not just bringing in that topic um, for the sake of it, but making sure that we're having connections that feel purposeful for our learning goals as well. So this is your opportunity to say, right, here's my list. These are the objectives that I want to address over the course of a particular ELA unit of study. How can I bring in texts that have current events connections, but then I can also talk about during my social studies and science units. So if there's an event that happens right in the community and I can pull in that article to work on some ELA skills, how can I then connect that to what we're talking about, our conversations in social studies or our conversations in science? So these application of reading skills across the content areas is crucial. We want students to dive into text, not their science textbook, as much as short text that help you introduce content area specific information, that domain specific vocabulary that's gonna be so important for students as readers, writers, listeners, and speakers within a isolated social studies or science classroom, we also want to make sure that those pieces connect to the goals on our list of objectives and what we know we want students to be able to do within the reading classroom. So in some classrooms that are, right, we move through, right, in 40-minute cycles across the school day, you might see yourself as simply, right, the ELA English teacher, just the social studies, just the science. But the truth is, right, we're able to apply reading skills in all of these content areas and if you are taking on the task of being the sole ELA person in your um, that your students see during the day right what kind of things are happening in your planning and your thought process to connect to those goals that the teachers also servicing your students within content areas have right how are those connections being made so in order to apply reading skills across the content areas and make sure that students are, are reading throughout the day, you might carve out planning time with other teachers that are working with your students or teaching content to the same grade level that you are working with. Or if you are a classroom teacher that sees the same students all day long or are most of the day, thinking about how your curriculum map really threads together so that you can make those reading connections clearly throughout the school day. So some things to think about when you are making those plans, you may want to revisit and look at your reading scope and sequence of what units you'll be hitting on across the school year, your writing units across the school year, and then line that up with your social studies and science content. And that's moving throughout the school year. So you can say, you know, I'm teaching westward expansion right in the beginning of the year, but I'm also teaching narrative writing at the beginning of the year. So how can those pieces go together? Well, I want students reading about westward expansion so that they can then use that reading and research to create a product, to write something, their response to that reading that connects to their social studies goals, the writing goals that they have, they're reading with a purpose of meeting both of those goals. So you might be the person who is 
tasked with having students for both social studies, for writing and for reading, and knowing what that you know, common thread might be, or having conversations with a person who is instructing within that social studies part of the day to say, how can I make sure that my students are reading things that are purposeful, right, and connected to those social studies goals? The same can be said, right, in the science classroom. If your students are focused on an informational text strategies, right, doing a multi-week unit on diving into informational text, and you want them to really apply those skills in a variety of contexts. Well, in the science classroom, if they are learning about ecosystems, right, how are we choosing texts in the reading classroom to help connect and reinforce the big ideas, the domain-specific vocabulary that's happening during the science chunk of the day. So this all really comes together as that purposeful planning for having open dialogue amongst the grade level team um, that is working with a particular population so that you can make sure students are really interested in what they're reading because they have a lot of background knowledge. It's popping out throughout the day. You're choosing texts that are connected to interests within those subtopics that you've identified. You're thinking about whether there's current events connections, right, about that ecosystem, about a place out west, depending on what it is that you're reading, and that you're making sure that those reading skills are being applied throughout the school day because reading is really happening throughout the school year, school day, and of course throughout the school year as well. So when you're thinking about gathering texts that are going to be high interest, and connect to cross-curricular goals, right? You might have a collection, this is just an example, a great example of a Kids Discover, right? Collection where you have all of this content in one space that connects to goals that students have within, right, their social studies piece, but also, right, are something that they can dive into and you can see in blue underneath each one, right, that they can access at a Lexile level that's appropriate for them. So as they are working through level text, right, thinking about the strategies that they need in order to access informational text, picking up a topic sentence, noticing how a detail connects or supports an argument that's being made, threading that information together, and exploring and learning about the content that you have identified as being crucial for your social studies unit, right? all of these things are coming together and don't need to feel isolated throughout the school day. You know, one of the things that's so important for me when thinking about cross-curricular learning is how our work, right, when we're outside of the classroom, right, as adults, as readers, as viewers, as listeners, right, are not isolated into just those chunks of our day. So we want to make sure these cross-curricular learning opportunities um, feel authentic, are things that students can uh, dive into and apply really throughout the school day. So as we start thinking about gathering students' questions, right, listening to their wondering as part of cultivating a wonder mindset, building in opportunities for reading and research about topics students want to explore further, transferring that into ways for students to connect with reading content throughout the school day that addresses the learning goals that have been identified by you, by your district, by your state, right, that you know connect to what your students need in order to grow throughout the school year. We also want to think about how we can really push students to talk about what it is that they've read, and we can do that through a variety of, of prompting questions. And to get us thinking about how we prompt students, how we pose questions to them, I'll start off by sharing uh, this quote. Reading deeply means immersing oneself in the magic of the reading experience, asking questions and delighting in the findings while reading between the lines. Right? So we really want students to not have words stuck on a page or stuck on a screen, but really pushing to ask questions, to figure things out, to talk things through and infer, right, while they are, are diving into, into different texts. 
And so when we're thinking about what type of questions we can use to prompt readers, right, we really need to have our learning goals and our success criteria identified. So I talked about that in the context of right, ELA and social studies and science, your learning goal is what you want students to be able to do, right? We have our objectives set out. Those objectives might be ones that you develop or determine based on needs that you see students have. Those learning goals of what students should know and be able to do might be set out on a curriculum guide that you're using, right? So you know what it is. That's your objective that you want students to address. But then you also need to know what the success criteria is. And that for, you know, the way I think about success criteria is how do I know if you've got it? What am I looking for? What is going to determine and show me that you have successfully met the learning goal that I've set out to give you a space to explore through modeling, through direct instruction, through small group support, and just an opportunity to, to dive in and, and apply and, and practice that in action. So when you have your learning goal, then you can think about what it is that your success criteria might be. So if you want students to be able to synthesize, to gather information from two different passages and to pull that together to make an argument, how will you know if they've got it? Are you going to listen in to their conversations? Are you going to look to see what their reading response has? Right. So knowing the learning goals and the success criteria is important to help develop those prompting questions, those questions that are going to push students towards the, the end goal that you've set up for them. So if you know that you want students to pull information from two passages and to create a response that brings those pieces together, right, that is your, your, what you're looking for. That's how you'll know if they've, they've got it when they're able to do that. So your prompting questions might be things where you're pushing students towards particular evidence. You're asking them to compare two things together, right? So those prompting questions should connect pretty clearly to your learning goals and your success criteria as you are um, developing opportunities for students to talk about their learning. Our prompting questions can help students activate prior knowledge. So this is different than building background knowledge when we are you know, laying the foundation, when we're activating prior knowledge, students already have an experience and we just want to activate it. We just want to make sure that it's moved so it's front and center and then connected to what it is that we're doing. So if you're about to have students dive into a text that explores a topic, your prompting questions that can push them for discussions can be about things that you know they already know about a topic, should know about a topic, or are close connections to what they already know. So by pushing students with these prompting questions, we're helping them prepare for, for reading activities both independently and collaboratively. So we're moving from kind of our first prompting questions that not just check for understanding, but push kids towards demonstrating mastery with a success criteria you've outlined to questions that will prompt students to think about what they already know about a topic and then to push students as a way for fact finding for student interests. So your questions that you might then push out to students have to do more with figuring out what it is that they're interested in and helping them figure out what their interests are, are about a particular topic. So I love this uh, diagram uh, from the folks at Kids Discover that show off the connections, right, the, the pathways, the we're not moving one, two, three, four, but we're jumping around to all these different areas, which is such a part of the kind of natural way that we have let one question lead to another. So when we're prompting students to think about a, a big topic, say, you know, their earth science is their big topic, right? We're pushing them to think in different directions to help them, them go off and explore topics related to kind of that, that bigger idea. So by prompting students in different areas, right, we're pushing them with questions that will lead them to explore different pathways. So 
asking them what they already know about oceans or what type of extreme weather they've experienced or have they read about the largest mountain on our continent, right? All of these questions will not just give you some information or help kids move in the direction you'd like them to go, but will give you some information that is actionable, that is useful, and help kids start to understand that one question can lead to another, both in their small group and small group discussions and in their own thought process as they think about right, all of the questions that lead from, from one to another. And then with prompting questions, right, we're helping students develop transferable skills by pushing them to think about the connections between different topics, by questioning them to have them think how one thing leads to another, right, we're helping them understand that what's going on in the classroom is not an isolated, one-off opportunity for learning and exploration, but is something that we value and that is connected to what goes on, right, outside of the school building during the school day. So what can we do to help all of this get started right away? So when we talk about honoring curiosity in the reading classroom, what can we do to help get this to jump right in and make sure that this is starting tomorrow? And so in order to do this, we really want to come back to our, our big goals and make sure that curiosity is honored throughout the process. And so when we talk about this, right, we're giving kids opportunities to jump in right away. So that might be having them dive into a space of resources that we've curated, collected, and handpicked for them. It might be that we give them a lot of freedom and space to read and explore topics that are of interest to them. And while doing so, gathering information to see what are kids naturally curious about. If I give them the space, what are they writing down and putting on the wonder wall? So that when I dive into planning around specific curriculum goals that I have, right? what am I doing to make sure that I'm honoring student curiosity in all of those moments? So first starting off by thinking about what are your learning goals? What is it that you need to see students to do, uh, do in order to know that they've got it? And then as you're gauging their interest and seeing what they're interested and exciting about, how can you really take that to the next level and create opportunities for students to wonder about their world, to explore new topics and topics that they've identified as ones they want to learn more about, and really discover their world as readers? Because our goal, right, as classroom teachers, across different levels, and for those of us who now, you know, support um, folks who are working with students one-to-one -one as readers, we want to make sure that kids have opportunities to dive into lots of different texts, to have reading available to them throughout the school day, so they see this pattern of working through reading, exploring as a natural behavior of a person during any part of their life, not an activity that is isolated um, in, in just the classroom. So our big ideas from today that I want to make sure we kind of wrap up with and solidify as we then take a minute to, to take a look at questions that you have um, as well. So you might have those kind of popping in the, the chat box already. A wonder mindset is essential. It is a skill that students need, just like they need to be problem solvers and critical thinkers. We need to make sure that students, when they leave the classroom, are curious, are interested, are asking questions throughout their day. We want to make sure that reading and researching feels valued as real world skills. The same way that someone might read up before they purchase a new washing machine or research before they make a decision on a place to travel or visit. Right? These are real skills that students cultivate in the context of a variety of content area goals and we want to make sure that students understand how to navigate a variety of reading materials and work through um, those nonlinear pathways as they gather information as readers. 
we also want to make sure that we value the power, that we know that cross-curricular learning is powerful, that helps students make connections, not just between their morning and afternoon, but between the content that pops up throughout the school day. Prompting wondering in your class discussion is one of our big ideas for today, making sure that we are posing questions that connect to our learning goals and our success criteria, but also get kids wheels spinning as they think about what they're interested and excited about. And of course, you know, really the biggest idea from today is that you can start tomorrow by picking and choosing different spots by introducing a wonder wall, by demonstrating your thinking aloud when you pull up a digital text on your screen. You know, this is doable. Kids will feed off of your energy with this too, um, because we want to make sure we're honoring curiosity throughout the school day, especially um, during the time in the reading classroom. Monica, thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> That was really an awesome program that you put together and uh, you know I think just for all the attendees when we linked up with Monica this past summer to explore ideas around webinar topics we could do this fall it really didn't take us very long to settle on the topic of curiosity in the classroom and you know I should say more specifically ways to really encourage empower and enable students to tap into their own innate curiosity um, but I think it's really important to note, and Monica touched on some of this, is that sort of traditional curriculum, traditional scope and sequence, it isn't really designed to honor curiosity. And in fact, it's kind of designed to do the opposite. Um, and same goes with traditional curriculum products like textbooks. You know, traditional curriculum and curriculum products follow a very fixed, linear, finite path towards learning. And that's really an opposition of the entire notion of curiosity and a lot of the sort of 21st century skills that Monica has been hitting home today. Um, and so as a result, there aren't that many models for how you can create a learning environment that does this. And maybe more importantly, there isn't a lot of support at the school or district level that encourages educators to honor curiosity in the classroom. And I, I don't wanna make a blanket generalization because the team here at Kids Discover talks to educators every single day and that are doing just that, honoring their students' curiosity and creating time to ask questions and for students to explore and discover what interests them. Um, but I guess the point that I am getting at is that the role of technology is really changing this. I mean, digital curriculum isn't better than print because merely it's digital, uh, same with resources, but rather, Digital enables a student to set their own learning journey, to chart their own path, to use new skills and tools to pursue understanding and mastery of a subject, and to kind of go on that nonlinear journey that you could never get through you know, a traditional textbook. Um, and that's something that we feel really passionate about here at Kids Discover, something that we're working really hard to enable in and out of classrooms. And this is really the inspiration of Discover Mode. If, you can picture that sort of web of uh, bubbles that Monica showed uh, for earth science. Um, and, you know, it's, it's if, if you've ever been down sort of a Wikipedia wormhole yourself, that's kind of the best way to describe <laughs> it, except it's just for Kids Discover content, it's really visual. And, um, but, you know, uh, it's, it's really interactive. And, you know, you could start in a category like life science and click into our unit on ecology and from there you might find yourself connected to a unit on rivers which could also lead you to our unit on mississippi river and from there you could go to our unit on mark twain which is also connected to our units on language and industrial revolution so you know that's kind of an example of one of these paths where you would never get that in, in a traditional curriculum product um, and more importantly it's it's student-led you know the student in five clicks is going from ecology to the industrial revolution and you know having a discussion about what was the path that you took uh, is something that's really really interesting and something that's really going to be memorable and a, and a key takeaway for your students um, and so you know that's that's really just sort of um, you know something that creates more context uh, in the content that you need to teach and 
we've designed in such a way where you don't need to be pulling all these separate resources together. They're all right there waiting to be discovered right within Kids Discover Online. That's just one example of how we're using technology to create and encourage new modes of learning. Um, so, uh, you know, if you do have any interest in learning more uh, about Kids Discover, I would encourage you to go to this landing page, kidsdiscover.com slash online, uh, or get in touch with us and send us an email at questions at kidsdiscover.com. Um, before we finish up, I did just want to address a few questions, and I know we're about to run out of time, so we'll keep it pretty short. But we did get one question. I'm going to direct this to Monica. Um, the question is, how can I convince my principal to better embrace a classroom of curiosity? I guess sort of that's getting to is, you know, how do I get a little bit more buy-in? How do I get a little bit more support? Um, and uh, that, you know, that might be a little bit of a tricky one, Monica, but have you yeah. stumbled upon any strategies specifically about maybe how you can get a little more buy-in at the administrative level? I think it's really, that's a wonderful question and it's so important and, you know, like I was mentioning earlier in the webinar, I was working with, you know, a group of teachers today and that's, I always like to say, you know, when we have these conversations, we want to make sure we're being, um, we're honoring the logistical challenges, right, the real things that we face because when we, do, we don't do that, right, we don't put it into practice. So thank you for, for posing that question. And so I think the best most powerful thing you can do is connect it to your standards and learning objectives, right? So if you know, say you're working, you know, a common core as an example, right? There's speaking and listening standards that you can connect to conversations that students will have around topics that they're passionate about. You are reading informational texts with a checklist of skills. Let it be a text that kids pick from. And maybe you start off by giving them three or four options and not let them just kind of go off, but that can help kind of really be explicit about your connections as well. And there's also some good resources. The Curious Classroom is a fantastic book. Um, that's one worth investigating. You know, my new book, which comes out in a few weeks, Tasks Before Apps, I talk, I have a whole chapter on curiosity um, and the classroom from a creation and reading you know, standpoint too. Um, so definitely the more you can be clear about your connections to the things that your admin may be looking for, like standards connections or objective connections, um, the better. And how you can pull choice in, and maybe choice might be your word you use with them, and then um, bring in kind of the curiosity component too. Yeah, that's really interesting. I think you know that was a, a, a big one, linking it up with standards. Um, uh, great answer, Monica. Um, we did have a question about Reading levels, Monica did point out that, you know, there's multiple Lexal reading ranges in one of the screenshots she shared. So um, I, I will just mention that all the content within Kids Discover Online is offered at three different Lexile reading ranges. Um, you know, this is something that uh, students can select from low, medium, or hard, a little bit like Newzell if they're uh, using it on their own. But also there are tools as an educator for you to assign one of those reading levels at the student level so that when you've assigned a reading list or you've assigned um, a certain set of articles for your student, when they go in in that assignment, the platform will automatically serve up the appropriate reading level. So that's just another tool that we've developed um, to help differentiate uh, the lessons. And we did get a question about sort of uh, cost around Kids Discover Online. So it, it is a, a freemium model. You can sign up and register for free. Uh, you'll get access to about 20% of our library. And then up from there, we sell uh, educator subscriptions and we also do school and enterprise subscriptions. And that's priced out based on the number of educators and students that are gonna be using the plan. Um, so if you're at a, a smaller school or you only have a few educators that are gonna be using it, you're going to get a, a much better uh, plan than, you know, if the entire school is using it. And um, it usually comes out to about five to six dollars per student per year, which is pretty competitive. Um, I, I wish we could get to, uh, you know, the handful of questions we still have left. We are essentially up against time. Uh, Monica put together an awesome program. Thank you again, Monica. Yet any last sort of words of wisdom that you uh, want to leave off before we close out? 
Oh, I just hope that you were able to to gather some tips to really promote a sense of curiosity in your classroom. And most importantly, right, showing kids what you're interested about, what you're curious about is a huge part of modeling that lifelong learning for them as, as readers, both inside the classroom and, and beyond the classroom as well. Awesome stuff, Monica. Well, thank you so much for preparing this webinar on uh, teaming up with us here at Kids Discover. And thank you to all the attendees for joining in. Uh, we hope you had some tangible takeaways. Um, look out for an email. We will send a recording of this webinar for you to watch again or share with your colleagues. And we're also going to share uh, an abbreviated version of this presentation so you can also go through the slides again. So. Um, on behalf of uh, Monica and Kids Discover, thank you everyone and we hope you have a great evening.